All right, we're gonna start with the open meeting law tonight. Uh, we're gonna start by covering uh, key basics. Then we're going to go through the life cycle of a meeting uh, and cover executive sessions and complaints. Uh, and then a few other uh, key takeaways. So the very basics. All of the capitalized terms will be defined in more detail shortly. All public bodies must post notice if they were going to have a meeting. Meetings and um, yes, there are copies of the slides on the back table. Uh, all meetings and deliberations within meetings must be open and accessible to the public unless there is a valid reason for executive session. And minutes must be kept for all meetings and published uh, in a timely fashion. So what is a public body? Many of you serve on public bodies. It is every board, commission, committee, subcommittee, multi-member decision-making body of the town, however created, elected, appointed, constituted, that is established to serve some public purpose. Critically, subcommittees count, and subcommittees need not be formally designated as subcommittees. You can make a subcommittee by accident. Uh, it has happened before. Any time two or more board members are wielding delegated authority, uh, they have generally formed a subcommittee subject itself to the open meeting law. And in, in normal life, it would be in the public sector life, uh, you've just created a subcommittee um, on science um, curriculum. So um, that means that subcommittee now needs to post its meetings and hold its meetings in a publicly accessible site and keep minutes. So you want to be very careful about creating subcommittees. There may be very good reasons to create subcommittees, but they do not simplify your open meeting law compliance obligations in any way. What is a meeting? A meeting is any time a quorum of a public body deliberates. What is not a meeting? Any time a quorum of a public body is in the same place and does not deliberate. Public gatherings, such as fundraisers for local causes. Private gatherings, such as open meeting law trainings, site visits, meetings of other public bodies, a town meeting. Again, though, you have to be very careful not to deliberate. If you attend meetings of another public body, you all get up and a quorum of your board gets up to ask questions, and the questions are really about things that are within uh, your jurisdiction, you run the risk of just having deliberated outside of a properly noticed meeting and violated, violated the open meeting law. Um, if you're going to be at a public meeting where you expect other members of your public body to be, be careful. Deliberation, finally, is any communication concerning business within the public jurisdiction of the public body that reaches a quorum of the public body. Email counts, so do texts, posts on Facebook groups, messages on Facebook Messenger, YouTube, Snapchat, TikTok, I can go on. Critically, the, the communication does not have to simultaneously reach every public body member, and it doesn't have to go through the same channel to every public body member. If Alice, Bob, and Carol constitute a quorum, of the Acton Planning Board, and Alice emails her thoughts to Bob, and Bob texts Carol to comment on Alice's views, Alice's views have now reached a quorum of the Planning Board, the Planning Board has deliberated, and the open meeting law has been violated. This does not mean that you cannot communicate on any aspect of uh, what is going on. It means you are limited to communicating in meetings or if outside of meetings on matters that are not within your substantive jurisdiction. 
meeting agendas, so long as you're not commenting on the substance of what's on the agenda, scheduling information, purely procedural points, um, distributing reports and documents, so long as the reports don't reflect the views of individual members. As a general rule, the best practice uh, is going to be that if you think uh, you might be expressing a substantive opinion, keep it to yourself until you arrive at a, a duly post at a duly noticed meeting. So again, in the private sector, email is a wonderfully efficient tool for getting things done. In the public sector, uh, it is it is a wonderful tool for getting yourself into trouble with the open meeting law. Um, so anytime you're using email for your board or your public duties, you need to be very, very careful that you are dealing only in administrative matters. When is the meeting? Where is the meeting? Um, distributing documents for the meeting. It cannot, um, even talking about what's going to be discussed at the meeting can, can lead very quickly into um, an open meeting law violation. For instance, if, if you have Alice, Bob, and Carol um, talking about what should be on the planning board agenda on email, and Alice says, well, I heard this new mini mall's coming, and we have to get out in front of this thing because that's going to be a disaster, so let's put that on the agenda, right? She's just talking about what's going to go on the agenda. But in doing so, she's, she's made it very clear what her opinion is on a matter that's coming before that planning board. And so she has slipped right into an open meeting law violation, clearly unintentionally, but a violation nonetheless. So anytime you're using email, you just have to be very careful about the content of those communications. Something else to be very careful about uh, is circulating drafts. And we're, municipal lawyers are particularly acutely aware of this issue since 2018, when the Supreme Judicial Court decided Bolter v. Board of Selectmen of Wayland. The court held that any circulation of documents containing the opinions of members, even if there isn't a direct back and forth between the members, constitutes deliberation among a quorum and the public must be permitted access. Um, this means that you can't make multiple rounds of revisions between the board and staff in between meetings. There is a safe harbor. Um, if the document reflecting the views of members is posted online simultaneously uh, with the distribution to members, um, it is permitted to be distributed in advance of the meeting. But as a general rule, the best practice is going to be to wait until the meeting to distribute the document. So you might be wondering how you actually distribute documents, because as public body members, you have to deal uh, with a great number. You have to deal with and review and process a great number of them. Use staff. Staff are crucial. Staff can act as the receptors of your opinions as long as uh, drafts reflecting those opinions are not subsequently circulated. Um, staff can distribute documents uh, in advance of meetings. If you're not supported by staff, you can have an individual board member do so, uh, fulfill the same role. But in that case, uh, you have to be, you cannot uh, provide comments to that board member in the way that you could provide comments to staff. Just to pause on that for a second. Um, to be clear, the open meeting law does not apply to town staff. So the paid people who work in town hall or across uh, the street, um, the open meeting law does not apply to them. You can email them about substantive matters of your board. You can ask them questions. You can come and sit down and talk to them. Uh, and they can act as a conduit for documents, as Paul was saying. So the open meeting law just does not uh, apply to staff. Do you guys have any questions with respect to, I find that folks usually have a lot of questions about how to distribute drafts of meeting minutes, how to get reports out. Yeah, Dean.
So amongst my other duties, I'm chairman of the Community Preservation Committee. Last night, we did our deliberations on projects. And the way we do those is we have a spreadsheet, which is distributed by staff. And we put in the recommendations from all of the members. Those are all scored individually and sent directly to staff. Then at the meeting, we reveal that entire spreadsheet. And from there, we make discussions. People change their numbers. Um, things get altered to come to consensus. So we're about three quarters of the way through the deliberation right now. And as a result of what we decided last night at 9.30, a new spreadsheet was developed, which was distributed today to all members so that everybody would know what we all have decided on. So since each column has somebody's name attached to it, because they're the member that voted, you know, $200,000 for the Ace of Parliament House, for instance, do each one of those columns actually represent an opinion from a member? And if so, was this an unwitting violation of the open meeting law because we distributed it amongst ourselves? So I like what you're thinking. I'll grab this one off and hang on myself. Um, so I like what you're thinking. The answer, if you all had distributed this all shared what your opinions were on the rankings or the dollar amounts and sent it all out to everyone before the meeting to prepare, that would be a problem. But where you shared those opinions and, and let me back up. That spreadsheet certainly does show opinions of members. The issue is those opinions were simultaneously available to the public at the same time they were available to your board member. Because remember, what the open meeting law is trying to do is just trying to make sure that the, the workings of local government happens in, in front of people. People can see what's going on, right? So the CPC decided their numbers in, in relative rankings of projects in a public meeting and then put it in a spreadsheet. So a spreadsheet's essentially just acting as the minutes almost. Yep. Um, so you can distribute those. What can't happen is people can't change their numbers on the spreadsheets and send it back right. out to the board outside of the meeting. But, but the, the memorialization of opinions that were shared in a public meeting is not, not a violation. That's, that's akin to sending out minutes. Dodge the bullet. Anyone else on, on distributing documents? So I, I think I know the answer to this, but um, we distribute minutes. We, we distribute the previous minutes before each meet, you know, a couple days before each meeting so all the board members have a chance Sometimes the, the minutes contain opinions, but those were opinions that were expressed in the previous meeting. So are we, wh where you're, are we? Um, you're fine as long as the opinions were expressed uh, in public in the meeting. As Nina said, the goal is to make sure that deliberations, deliberations and the expression of opinions by members to quorums happens in public view. Um, and assuming the meeting itself was properly organized and held, um, then opinions were expressed in public view and memorializing those opinions in the minutes is uh, perfectly appropriate. And, and in fact, what the open meeting law will call for and we'll get there soon enough. Yeah, so in the, the, where most people get tripped up with minutes is it is fine to send out draft minutes to everyone. It's when Alice and the planning board has comments on the minutes and says, well, I wasn't opposed to the mini mall for that reason. I was opposed to the mini mall because of traffic and congestion. And 
you need to change the, the minutes on that. If, if someone has comments on the minutes that are substantive, they need to hold those comments until the next meeting when you vote and discuss them. Yep. All right, so we're now into the life cycle of a meeting. You are a public body. You want to deliberate. You want to do it properly in a meeting. How? First, you publish an appropriate notice. At least 48 hours ahead, excluding non-business days, uh, you must publish the agenda and the notice for the upcoming meeting. You have to be a little bit proactive. If you want to meet at, on Monday at 6 p.m., the notice has to be out by Thursday at 6 p.m. It is easy to get tripped up on this. Once you, have the, once you have the notice, send it to the town clerk who will publish it on the website. If you have any question, you guys have a great town clerk's office. So anything to do with posting your meeting, questions about that, you ask the town clerk's office. They'll tell you if you have enough time. They'll tell you if you can post it in time. And they will review most of this content and make sure you've got a, a proper notice. The notice uh, serves two basic purposes. Telling the public uh, what's going to happen so members of the public can assess whether they want to come and learn what's happening and come and follow the business of the public body. And telling the public how they can do so. And the requirements uh, largely track those two goals. So you need the date, the time, the place. Uh, place used to be more typically physical. These days it's more, these days it's just as often a Zoom link or an equivalent. The notice needs to contain the date and time it was posted so that somebody looking at the notice can assess whether the notice was posted in compliance with the open meeting law. And it must set out the topics to be discussed at the meeting um, with a certain degree of specificity. There's a mini mart coming to Main Street in Acton. Um, the meeting notice can't simply say Main Street project. It can't simply say mini mall. It should say project at 100 Main Street or mini mall at 100 Main Street or site plan review for 100 Main Street project. Um, <clears throat> the topics must be those that the chair reasonably anticipates. Emergencies happen. If something comes up within 48 hours um, that has to be addressed, you're under a statutory deadline, uh, or you have a deadline to apply for a state grant. Publish a new notice as soon as you possibly can um, so that members of the public uh, know about it and to, frankly, demonstrate your good faith and the genuineness of the emergency. Um, discuss it if you must, but understand that if it can possibly be saved for a future meeting, the better practice is to do so. Um, the AG will generally, the AG can be finicky about whether something is a genuine emergency. If you're at the meeting and the, you start drifting into something that wasn't covered uh, in the notice and agenda, uh, catch yourself or catch whoever's doing so, redirect the topics that were properly noticed, um, and, <clears throat> save, and save the other matters for a future meeting. Um, also, if there's a meeting, uh, we also recommend that you include a statement on accessibility, uh, which is also important in terms of the access, in terms of the literal accessibility of meetings to the public. Yeah, and so if, if you guys have questions on that, we have the town clerk's office has form meeting agenda notices um, and form meeting minutes, which will include all of the requirements that we've listed here. So if you're on a board or committee. Um, that is is searching around for the, the proper form um, or template to use the town clerk's office does have that. So you've properly noticed your meeting. You are now in the meeting. How does it go? The open meeting law has less to say about meeting procedures than you might expect. But as a general rule, uh, we recommend that the chair be responsible for scheduling meetings and for, for presiding, setting the agenda, and ensuring that the agenda is posted. And 
uh, that the chair be particularly sensitive to open meeting law compliance issues. Uh, but I do want to emphasize that everyone on the public body is responsible for open meeting law compliance issues. Um, the open meeting law has relatively little to say about public participation. Um, <clears throat> its goal is to make uh, government meetings accessible to the public, not to ensure the public's opportunity to participate directly in the meetings themselves. Uh, individuals can address the meeting with permission of the chair. At the chair's request, they should be silent. Uh, if there's a serious disruption, the chair can order the person to leave or uh, mute them, as the case may be. I do want to emphasize that the First Amendment does place some limits on uh, how you can cut off speech once you have allowed speech. Please focus on disruptive conduct rather than content uh, that you may feel is disruptive. Um, because government bodies in the United States cannot discriminate based on the content or the viewpoint of the speech of individuals. Um, <clears throat> if, you are, if you're dealing with um, a topic that you know has a lot of interest, so for instance, obviously the last two years, Paul and I have been dealing with quite a few boards of health meetings, school committee meetings, where there's um, a lot of public interest and a lot of public angst about whatever vote they're taking. Um, that's where this particular aspect of the open meeting law has been coming up quite a bit in the last two years and people saying, you know, people will go on forever and ever about their opinions on a mask mandate, about a vaccine mandate, about the science behind COVID, about the science behind the vaccines. There is also these boards of health and school committees that actually need to get through their agenda. So they've had to use this, this um, power under the open meeting law to say, okay, I'll hear from everyone for two minutes. Uh, again, as Paul said, that's what we call a kind of content, content neutral regulation, right? We're not talking about pro or con. I'll hear from everyone for two minutes, but then we've got to vote and move on to the next topic. So it, it is important um, to understand that um, the open meeting law itself doesn't um, require or obligate a board to hear from members of the public as long as they want to talk to you about the issue that's in front of you, um, regardless of, kind of how strongly they feel about that. Um, it's, it's always smarter to, I think, you know, we've all seen in the past couple of years, it's always smarter to let someone say their piece uh, if they can do so in a respectful manner and, and they, a lot of people just want to be heard. Um, so we don't encourage you to cut that off at all, but um, the law does um, provide a, the public body an ability to you know, move the meeting along and get things done if, if they need to. And if you expect a lot of public comment and especially a lot of heated public content comment, uh, the best thing to do is to establish ground rules in advance and enforce them even-handedly. So, uh, we used to have a slide on how remote participation works, uh, but <laughs> you about- You only do it in certain circumstances, and special occasions. On, on Tuesdays, yeah. uh, things changed a little bit almost exactly two years ago, uh, as you might be aware. So we have new remote participation slides. Oh, Dean, look, you're up there. <laughs> Uh, I tried to get a screenshot where everyone was smiling, and I think I got really close. Um, so early in the pandemic, uh, the legislature gave public bodies two options that they didn't have beforehand. And this provision has been repeatedly extended, most recently to July 15th, 2022. Uh, I'm not gonna stand here and handicap odds, but there are at least reasonable odds that this will be extended again um, or reenacted uh, if cases flare up next winter. So, until mid July, maybe longer, public bodies can, first of all, rather than meeting in a physical location accessible to the public, um, meet anywhere they like so long as the public has access by adequate alternative means. Generally speaking, this is going to mean that if you meet by Zoom, uh, the public should be able to drop into the Zoom call. If you meet in a physical location but do not open it to the public, you should be live streaming it simultaneously. 
Um, the other option that you have is to meet entirely remotely. Now, if any member joins remotely, realistically these days, when every member joins remotely, at the top of the meeting, the chair must name all members participating remotely. All votes must be taken by roll call of the individual members. And if you enter into executive session, not only do you have to follow all of the ordinary procedures, once you are in executive session, every member of the public body has to state that nobody else can, in, in this room with them can hear the executive session. So if the chair has to name the members participating remotely, the whole board is being remotely. Yes. For acting, I think most boards, most chairs have that little blurb that they read with respect to why they're meeting remotely. And then when um, I think they, most boards take a roll call to open the meeting remotely, that roll call serves as essentially an acknowledgement of each member who is there. Um, one more thing, someone's internet uh, goes on the fritz in the middle of the meeting. The best practice is generally to pause deliberations until they're able to fully participate in the call. You are actually required to, if somebody is absent for a portion of deliberations because of uh, technical issues, you are required to note that in the minutes. Um, and frankly, I don't expect you to remember to do that, so please just pause <coughs> uh, deliberations if somebody has technical issues. It's a very niche point. All right, you've noticed your meeting. You have met. Now you have minutes. Um, you should keep this slide, refer to it uh, when you're evaluating minutes for completeness. Um, you need the date, the time, the place, who was present uh, from among the members of the public body um, what discussions took place, what issues were raised, what votes were cast, uh, the list of documents used by the public body at the meeting. Uh, you used to need to individually identify the remote participants. Um, that requirement uh, is now not so much of an issue when a meeting is entirely remote. One question I always get on this one is, what does it mean documents used in the meeting? Um, it means any documents that you're physically looking at, any documents that you're referring to, whether that's the last meeting's minutes, whether it's an application to your board, those need to be listed in your minutes. They don't need to be attached to your minutes. They need to be listed. So again, in the template that Eva has of meeting minutes, um, a, a block on the bottom will say documents used and it'll just be a, a list of documents that you looked at, photographs of 100 Main Street, you know, written statements from members of the public, stuff like that. And you do not need, on the record of uh, the board's decision making, you do not need to create a verbatim transcript of the meeting. Your obligation is to create minutes that are clear enough that a member of the public who was not present would be reasonably able to understand the discourse that took place on the board. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the members present and listing the members present. With our virtual meetings, sometimes there are a lot of members that don't choose to speak and their name listed in the participants line that goes down on our right side of our Zoom screens um, may not be apparent, um, the, the username that they provide. Is it um, appropriate for the board or the chair to have each person identify themselves for the minutes? Uh, yes, that's, uh, that's a good idea. Are, um, you, are it, you talking about members of the public or members of the board? Members of the public. Oh, pardon me. That's what I thought. Yeah, um, the, <clears throat> the minutes requirement is that members of the board who are present be noted um, because uh, the public should be able to understand what members of the board were deliberating on the matters that were before the board that night. Um, there is no requirement to list members of the public uh, who are present in the minutes. There has been many a question in, in, over the past year in this town and in other towns about people identifying themselves when they want to make public comment from the public. 
people attending and so i think we've had a couple of decisions from uh the division of open government i think on this point people attending the remote meeting you know they have their screen off or you can't see them if it's a webinar function and they just have no name written in that's absolutely fine if they want to speak they can be required to identify themselves um, so that this has come up I mean this came up a lot at the beginning of the pandemic with zoom bombing um, and and um, has come up with some folks since then on more controversial topics where folks want to come in and say their piece but don't want to identify themselves. Like a public meeting, remember when we used to all meet in this room and you'd stand up and talk, the first thing you'd say is, I'm Nina Pickering Cook of 11 Pearl Street. Um, it, it is the same thing online. If you want to speak at a public meeting, you must identify yourself. All right, we're going to take a brief detour into executive session uh, and then wrap up minutes, at which point we will be done with the life cycle of a meeting. Before we get into that, how many of your boards and committees hold executive sessions besides deans? So zoning board, library does sometime? Okay. Okay, usually it's, it's usually only the land use boards and, and the selectmen. Specifically, we're, we have a subcommittee who's doing a search for the new library director. So um, interviews, personnel information, uh, discussing personal you know, nature. We are talking about do we need to go into executive session when it's time for that? Yes. yes. So this is a niche topic um, that, again, I'll just take because I've um, done this before with the same board and with other boards, um, executive searches. Um, we have a whole procedure set out for you all of how you should conduct the search with respect to open meeting law issues, and I'll get that to you. Okay. So Nina, I think it makes sense to be relatively brief on executive sessions since we don't have that many board members. <clears throat> all right. Um, Executive sessions are permitted uh, when there is some legitimate reason for the public body to deliberate out of public view. Generally, this means that the town uh, has a strategic position that would be compromised by public disclosure, or an individual has a privacy interest that would be compromised by public disclosure. Um, <clears throat> it is still important for the public to know as much as they can about these deliberations that take place in private. Um, so there are extensive procedural requirements about how executive sessions are noticed, how you enter them, how you leave them, um, and how much information you have to give about them. The upshot is that in both the meeting notice uh, and to enter the executive session during a public meeting, um, you need to give as much information as you can about what you are deliberating about uh, without obviously compromising the interest that the executive session itself protects. Um, you must maintain accurate minutes, uh, which eventually are often released, and you must take all votes by roll call when in executive session. And this is crucial uh, and gets public bodies into trouble all the time. You may only discuss in executive session the purpose, the, the, the subject matter for which the executive session was lawfully called. I think there used to be a, a feeling with executive sessions like you would go into executive session and the door would close and like the secretary would put their pencil down and be like, okay, now we're going to stop taking minutes, right? No one record this. It's an executive session. That is not the law. You continue taking the minutes the exact same way. You take them in a different document or a different piece of paper so they're not confused with the open session minutes, but you take minutes nonetheless. It can be very easy to slip from uh, the lawful purpose of the executive session to something that is not the lawful purpose of the executive session. So the uh, planning board has permitted the mini mall on Main Street, but with a permit condition that the developer doesn't like. And the developer has sued. The planning board puts, these, puts this permit condition on a lot of properties. 
The planning board enters executive session to discuss its position in the litigation. And one member of the planning board has questions about why we use these permit conditions generally. That is a matter, matter of general policy that should be saved for open session. Um, discussing why the permit condition makes sense on this property and whether the town could settle the lawsuit by giving up the permit condition, perfectly fine. But the minute you're thinking about enacting it generally, uh, you're, <clears throat> you're on subject matter that is not within the scope of the executive session. It can be very easy to slip from specific uh, matters to general policy matters. Um, I am not going to read you a list of 10 executive session purposes. Again, the basic themes are cases where the town has a strategic position that needs to be protected or individuals have privacy interests that similarly need to be protected. Um, <clears throat> I want to highlight uh, two points. So the first is on the second bullet point. So while you can conduct strategy sessions for contract negotiations in executive session, um, actually approving the contract has to take place in open session. Second of all, uh, points three, six, and eight, the ones highlighted in red. You may only go into executive session if discussing that subject matter in public would actually hurt the town's position. And you need to specifically say uh, when noticing the meeting and when going into executive session that discussing the subject matter in public would hurt the town's position. This is another point that trips towns up on a regular basis. Again, one note on this with these 10 purposes, this is an exhaustive list. This is not an example list, right? If you do not see the, your reason for going into executive session on this list, you should not be going into executive session. I should have said, this is drawn directly from the statute. All right, back to minutes. Uh, you not only have an obligation to <clears throat> create minutes that, to, for your minutes to satisfy certain standards, you actually need to create them promptly and publish them and give them to people who ask for them. So when it comes to open session, you have to approve minutes in a timely manner. Uh, that means whichever is longer of 30 days or three regularly scheduled meetings. If someone requests minutes or draft minutes, they must be released within 10 calendar days. Uh, if you're familiar with the public records law, you may know that the public re everything under the public records law is done in business days, and you may be looking at this 10 calendar days and thinking, what's going on here? Meeting minutes are governed by the open meeting law, not the public records law. The timeline is different, uh, and this trips people up on occasion. Uh, you must release draft minutes. You must release documents uh, that were used in the meeting if asked for. The best practice, and I believe this is actually required, uh, is, to post, uh, is to post the approved minutes as soon as you have them. The best way to make sure that you're being diligent about doing this is just to make sure your first agenda item at every meeting is to approve the last meeting's minutes. Um, I think, again, that's on our form uh, template, but that should be the practice of your board as well. It's really easy once you start missing approving the last meeting's minutes, all of a sudden you're six months behind. And if someone cares about, you know, a topic you've talked about within those six months, um, it is low hanging fruit for them to complain that you haven't been doing your minutes in a timely fashion. Um, it is also a good practice to designate a point person, typically the chair, to ensure that uh, the public body is generating and publishing minutes. Do not designate two point people. At that point, you have a subcommittee. Refer back to slide two. <laughs> um, <clears throat> executive session minutes are a little bit more complicated. Um, depending on the reason you went into executive session, uh, the Reason, the grounds for secrecy may last forever or they may be temporary. If it concerns a piece of litigation and the piece of litigation is over and done with, uh, the ex reason for secrecy no longer holds. So you must approve and disclose uh, executive session meeting minutes once the reason for secrecy has run out unless they are protected either uh, as exempt un documents under the exemptions contained in the public records law 
or uh, their attorney-client privileged. The best practice here, again, is to have a point person responsible for re reviewing executive session meeting minutes periodically and making recommendations to the board on whether to release. And if you guys have questions on this stuff, Lisa in the town manager's office is very good about keeping track of um, these types of issues for her board. Um, and I'm sure can help you guys out with executive session minutes as well as far as reviewing them to figure out what can be released and what can't be released. All right, one more subject on the open meeting law, complaints. Step zero, somebody does not like how the public body conducted itself. Step one. Well, Paul, I'm gonna disagree with you. Step zero is someone doesn't like what the public body has done and is looking for a way to complain about it. People getting upset about the open meeting law are very, very rarely actually upset about the open meeting law, right? They're upset about the mini mall going in on Main Street. They're not really upset that you haven't published your minutes for six months. But it is just a great vehicle for making your board look bad or disparaging your board, right? So we wanna not give people, um, again, that low hanging fruit of something to complain about. Um, because if, if your board's doing its job, at some point it's likely to get on the wrong side of someone. Um, everyone has, is dealing with policies and there are different sides on, on all sorts of policies. Um, and someone's gonna be upset about what you did and look for a reason to undermine that. So, um, so Paul is mostly right, but I find that it's very rarely about the open meeting law itself. I take the correction. <laughs> so step one is the person files a complaint with the public body. Step 1.5, despite not having a full round number, this is incredibly important. Town council should be notified and involved with the response as early as possible. Once town council is involved, we come to step two, where the public body responds. Um, the public body must meet within 14 business days to review the complaint and either uh, take corrective action, decide no corrective action will be taken, or delegate a decision about what kind of corrective action is going to be taken to a member of the public body, to staff, or to town council. Uh, this 14 business day time limit is often an issue for boards that simply don't meet very often. Um, if you're serving on one of those and you receive a, uh, an open meeting law complaint, Talk to town council immediately. Uh, we can help you request additional time from the attorney general's office, which does grant extensions for good cause. Um, we wanna be sparing with these and use them only where appropriate um, so that we can, so that we're seen as good actors and we get them where they're, when they're appropriate. Um, but if it's important to your board, you can't muster a quorum in time, don't hesitate to talk to us and we will, <clears throat> uh, and we will see if we can help out. Also, uh, if the complainant did not give you enough information to adequately review and respond to the complaint, you can ask for additional information, which uh, shifts the deadlines around somewhat as well. If they don't like how you responded to their complaint, they can escalate to the Attorney General's office. The Attorney General's office will review the complaint, the response from the town. They may ask us or the complainant additional questions. They'll decide whether the complaint uh, is valid, whether an open meeting law violation took place, and what, if any, remedies there should be. Typically, when they find a, viol a violation, the remedies are going to be in categories one and two. They will compel future open meeting law compliance. They will compel uh, <clears throat> additional open meeting law training. Um, if minutes are, haven't been timely produced, if there are issues with minutes, they'll issue the minutes, they'll order the minutes to be released as soon as possible or corrected as soon as possible. It is relatively rare to get into circumstances where the AGO uh, will nullify the action taken by the public body or fine the public body for an intentional violation, but it can happen in cases of egregious or particularly in cases of repeated open meeting law violations. Uh, 
Um, I do want to be clear, the open meeting law does not speak to, and the Attorney General's office does not handle, uh, but people do sometimes complain about uh, allegedly unethical content conduct during meetings. Uh, that's an entirely different set of state statutes. Um, the conduct of public hearings, such as zoning appeals, or policing the truth and accuracy of statements made at open meetings. All right. It is a lot better to not get into trouble in the first place. If there is a problem with uh, the entirety of a posted notice, postpone the meeting. If there is a problem with an item on the agenda, postpone the item. If you receive a problematic and arguably deliberative email from a member of the public body, gently point out uh, that they should not do that. If there's a pattern of, po of problematic emails, talk to the town manager. If you're in executive session and discussion strays off topic, speak up, get people back on topic. Um, it is better to be out ahead of open meeting law issues whenever you possibly can be. Um, relatedly, <clears throat> if you are new to town office, there is an AG certification which you should, uh, which you should sign and file within two weeks of coming on board. So if there are no more questions about the open meeting law, I'm going to move to public records. Seeing none. Again, this is in your slides. Uh, please keep this slide. This is your flowchart for any public records matters. <clears throat> when a public records request comes in, in whatever form uh, it comes in, be it verbal, uh, sorry, be it spoken, emailed, formal, informal, through official channels, uh, through unofficial channels, a 10 business day clock starts ticking for the town to uh, respond initially and potentially produce records. If the volume of the request is substantial, uh, the town can request a time extension. If a, charging a fee is appropriate, the town can uh, put its fee request in the response. But the request, the response need, an initial response at the very least needs to come out within 10 business days uh, or the town sacrifices certain, certain procedural rights um, and things <clears throat> and relations with the requester and with the supervisor of public records office uh, can get hairy quickly. In Acton, um, the town clerk's office is the records administrator, administrative officer, a records access officer, RIO. Um, and she keeps a log of all public records requests that comes in. So if you do get one directly to your board and committee that has not gone through the town clerk's office, I would recommend just looping in the town clerk. What she will do is she'll make us aware that the requests had come in. You know, 95% of requests can be handled by staff or by your board. You know, people are looking for minutes. They're looking for application materials for their neighbor's improvement. Um, but there are some requests that do get more complicated, either legally or technically. Um, so we need to be made aware of it. So just make sure you loop in the town clerk. Um, town clerk will know what that other 5% is, and they will know to bring us in on it. Uh, also, Nina, you corrected me, so I'm going to correct you on a tiny thing. No, Meeting minutes are not subject to the public records law. Oh, open meeting law. Open meeting law. 10 calendar days. Um, as with the open meeting law, the public records law is meant to ensure transparency and accountability um, while still protecting important uh, privacy interests, the ability of the government body to deliberate uh, private, privately when appropriate, security, ongoing investigations. Um, <clears throat> so records are presumed public. That includes communications with constituents. There is a list of 20 odd uh, state law exemptions, uh, as well as potential exemptions under federal law and the attorney client privilege, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, just like I did not read you a list of executive session purposes, I am not going to read you a list of the enumerated exemptions. What you should know is that they are narrowly construed 
and <clears throat> they must be specifically claimed in the town's response uh, in order for the town to in order for the town to be able to invoke them. Also, often a document is only partially exempt and you will generally be expected to redact the exempt portions rather than holding the entire document back. Attorney-client privilege. Any communication of legal advice uh, between counsel for the town and employees of the town. Uh, it is very important to protect the privilege. Once it is waived, it is waived permanently. Uh, if there is any question of whether something is privileged, uh, get town council involved or have the town clerk's office get town council involved. A lot of the other 5% of problematic requests are requests that uh, implicate attorney-client privilege in a significant way. Uh, we have a question? Yes. What's the definition of the employee of the town? So uh, as, as volunteers for the town, do we fall under that sort of same coverage of attorney-client privilege? Uh, generally, you should assume so. And uh, if, if there's any question, bring it to us and we will figure it out. Yeah, so employee does not mean paid. If you are on a board or committee, you are a municipal employee for the purposes of the public records law. Um, so that means a, a couple of things. It means all of your documents are subject to a request to see them um, that you maintain with um, your public duties. And it means um, you do have an obligation to maintain those as well. So if you have, for instance, emails to and from your board concerning matters in front of your board, those emails should not be routinely deleted. Those should be retained in case someone requests to see all your emails about the mini mall on Main Street. You need to produce those. So we'll get into that, but um, all of, um, all of the documents that you maintain or create for your board are public records, regardless of whether you're being paid as an employee or not. One other issue that I want to highlight uh, is the complexity of privacy in the year 2022. It can be astonishingly easy to identify people based on partial disclosures of their identifying information. Um, and the state courts increasingly recognize that fact and construe the privacy-related exemptions in the public records law, or in this case, in federal law, the federal, pardon me, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy, and Privacy Act, um, to cover not only information that is obviously identifying, but information that is potentially identifying when linked with other known information. Um, again, something to be sensitive to, something to talk to the town clerk's office or to us about. So, uh, <clears throat> once a document is released, it is released. If you have questions about whether a document is, pu is a public record or exempt, whether redaction is withholding or appropriate, the proper ways to respond, whether seeking fees is appropriate or even permitted, um, dealing with the supervisor of public records if your request or appeals, um, get the town clerk's office and us involved sooner rather than later. Uh, as I said earlier on, the town loses important procedural rights if they're not invoked early. Um, and I don't like telling town officials uh, that I could have been more helpful if they had talked to me 10 days earlier. Um, as soon as you think we might need to be involved, uh, see if you can involve us. So, as a general rule, uh, you should be familiar with the sub, you should be familiar with the public records law, uh, the regulations covering it. Uh, the departments you work with should have designated RAOs, um, and you should know who in town the town clerk's office to get in touch with. Um, don't create, this is, this is hard to do in practice, but you don't need to create records unnecessarily. You also don't need to maintain records forever, uh, depending on the nature of the record. 
The state supervisor of public records publishes a records retention schedule. Uh, town officials should be familiar with it and uh, not maintain records unnecessarily past it with no reason. Um, you should also understand where and how uh, your records are stored and particularly where and how records that have, that implicate privacy, security, uh, or other private, or <clears throat> other grounds for secrecy uh, are maintained. For instance, if you're wondering kind of what we're talking about there, we have boards like the Board of Assessors who are dealing with abatement applications, right? And, and people put in um, sensitive financial information that they're looking for with tax abatements, for instance. That information can't just be left in a file drawer in town hall for anyone to go in and see. It needs to be safeguarded and locked. And, um, and then there are other, you know, obviously if we're dealing with police records and things like that. So um, some of this stuff is applicable to your boards, um, some of it's not. Commonly requested records uh, must be published. Talk to, be familiar with and be prepared to involve your IT staff. This, they uh, come up all the time when you need to search all town databases. Um, we often encourage towns to have software to track requests and responses. Finally, personal accounts and devices. If you are doing public business on a personal account, forward everything uh, to a town email address. Um, when you cease to be employed by or volunteering for the town, you have to hand over all of your records. As a general rule, we encourage you to have a town email address or have, if a non-town email address, have an email address that is designated specifically for town volunteer activities. Because if there is a public records request uh, or frankly litigation, and we need to search for materials <laughs> that, are in our, that are in your personal email address, well, you don't want us searching in your personal email address. We don't want to search in your personal email address. Um, it is less privacy for you, generally costlier, more time consuming for the town. Um, best, to, uh, best to segregate out your town volunteer activities into a town account or a specifically designated account. But to be clear, if you have a town account um, or an account you use designated specifically for town stuff, and you happen to be sending emails back and forth with a member of your board on your own personal Gmail account, and there's a public records request for all of your communications with board members about the mini mall on Main Street, it is not a valid um, excuse to say, well, these are on my personal Gmail, so they're not public records. Those are public records if they're on your personal Gmail, if they're on your work computer, if they're on your work email, they're all public records because you are talking about a matter within your public, your duties as a public board member. So it does not matter what um, the kind of source of the communication is. Um, it's the content of that communication that I have had many board members who say, well, I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to turn over my personal Gmail to you. Um, and, and the Attorney General's office will have to come down with an order saying, yes, you will turn those documents over. Um, again, as Paul said, that's not a situation we want to be in, particularly with our own clients. So um, it's better to try to come up with a system to, to segregate those and have them be easily identifiable without you all having to search through your own emails for, for the responsive documents. Um, relatedly, social media, text messages can be public records. And as much as you do not want uh, Nina or me having to search your personal email, you really do not want us sitting there with your phone, screenshotting your texts with town staff, scrolling up, screenshotting again, and so on and so forth for an hour. And we really don't want that either. Um, we strongly recommend you not do town business uh, <clears throat> by social media or by text message. Um, keep it an email and keep it in a designated email as we've discussed. There is an example of this. Um, none of 
none of our towns, thankfully, um, are, that we are town council for, but there was, um, it kind of made it through the community of municipal lawyers like wildfire. There was a um, well-attended public meeting, something hotly debated. Um, it, lo it was a board of selectmen meeting. At some point, someone could tell that the select board members were texting, right? At least a couple of them were texting each other. You can tell they looked down at their phone, whatever. So, you know, the very next day, you get a request for all the text messages between the board of selectmen members during the hours of you know, 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. on Monday. Um, and those have to be produced. And you have people, no one intends their text messages to be seen, you know? And of course the text messages were like, who is this guy? I can't believe what he's saying and probably a lot worse stuff than that, right? Um, and you just have to be aware that especially in this day and age, people are watching, people see stuff, people know what to ask for. Um, if they want to cause problems, they can cause problems for you. Um, it, it, using the public records law, using the open meeting law. So you just really need to be quite um, judicious and diligent in, in policing yourself and your other board members about your use of technology. And that is what we have on the public records law. Do you, any of you have questions about that? What about uh, like Zoom meeting recordings? So the question was Zoom meeting recordings. Are they public records? Are they subject to the open meeting law? Do they, are they kept? I actually don't know the technical answer to that offhand, but I think the general best practice is to uh, preserve and publish them. Nina, do you happen to know the answer? No, nope. I, people, I don't know that the Attorney General has come out with an opinion on Zoom meetings. I don't think they have to be recorded and kept. Um, if they're, if it is something that is contentious, it's always a great idea to have it be recorded. If you're um, on Zoom anyways, it's quite easy to record and keep that recording. Um, but I, it's not a, a separate requirement of the open meeting law right now. If you are on Zoom and it's not being recorded, the only requirement is that you keep minutes. That is the open meeting law requirement. So it's, it's a difference between kind of best practice and, and what the law requires.